So in your bulletins, you may notice that someone decided to call this the girl sextet. You may notice also that two of us are not female, but that's fine. <coughs> so um, the song we're going to sing is, it kind of relates to what we just heard about. You know, Stephen and Paul both would not have been able to do the things they did in their life for God if they did not have the Holy Spirit in their lives. And Jesus said he would send his Holy Spirit to his followers once he had risen to heaven, and he did. And this song is about um, when Jesus said that he would send the Comforter after he uh, rose into heaven. It's called, I Will Ask My Father. Okay, now we'll have special music by the Shirley family. The song we'd like to share with you today is about a lady um, that wasn't very well looked upon in Jesus' day. It was Mary Magdalene, and she, but she loved Jesus because he had done so much for her, and she was willing to spend an amazing amount of money to give him the best gift that she could offer. I think this is the one that squeals. I'm going to switch. Sorry. Hopefully this one won't squeal. And she emptied out. She broke that alabaster box and emptied out all of that on Jesus' feet. And she didn't know the, sig the full significance of what she did. But Jesus was about to be broken and spilled out in love for all of us, for her and for the whole world. And God asks for each of us to be willing to have that same selfless love, to be broken and spilled out to reach 
a world that's lost in sin. See if the sound check will play. I think that's Johanna on the stage.
Happy Sabbath. Um, today's scripture is found in Mark 14, verse 9. Mark 14, verse 9. I'll give you guys a moment to find it. Okay, and it reads, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. You know, talking about canvassing, I have very special memories of canvassing. And there's one very special one. I was learning to canvass, and I was getting some calls in for visitation. But there was no phone number on this one particular. And I went to this house to knock on her door to get her number so I could call her and not just assume I could see her right on the spot because in the area I was, doesn't work well in that. Anyways, I decided to have enough courage to knock on the door. And there was no answer right away, but I heard this baby crying. But it was a cry. It was not a normal cry. Something was wrong. But as I opened the door, she opened about an inch. And as I looked, can I talk to you just for a second? And she says, what do you want? And she was really disturbed because of her baby. And I said, could we just make an appointment? Because you had sent this card in. And she accepted that. And then I went and um, I just stood at the door. I didn't go. And she went out to get a pencil, but her door flung open. I did not go in. I just stayed there. And I waited to her. She came back. And when she came back, she was totally distraught. And I just asked her a question. Do you need help? And she started to cry. And I said, may I come in? May I sit with you? Now, it really touches me, this story, because as I sat down with her and talked about Jesus, but not just because something was seriously going on with the baby, no question. It was a life-threatening situation. You could tell. And I'm thinking, okay, a lot of times we go to Jesus because we just want that baby healed. It's like the nobleman that wanted the son healed for selfish reasons. And, you know, God takes us where we're at, you know, and he works with us. But as I sat with her, shared with her that Jesus really loved her. And in this occasion, she really, really responded. It was tremendous. Not always do they respond right away. They, you leave a book or whatever. And it was only some days afterwards that her baby died. And she called me, but she was not totally devastated because she was depending on Christ through it. Can you imagine if we had not had that not happened? And there's so many times where we get diverted one direction to another direction. Oh, is it worth going here or not? And I remember one time I went out and I had a French con great controversy. Not that there are French people around. Sometimes I end up with a lot of different things. But that day, the Lord asked me to take my French controversy, and I did. And I thought, Lord, there's nobody here that speaks that language where I'm going. And I ended up in this place where there was a, a tower going all the way up. Very strange, but that was the address. But the only thing I didn't like was the dog that was on the outside. It was a fierce dog. And because of that, 
And I remember standing in front of it, and I had to make a choice, right? Like you always get through, and you, today we have something to kind of protect us. But, and then I said, you stay here. I'm going there. And the dog stood still. Praise the Lord. I have been bitten by dogs, so don't think it's never happened to heads. But in this case, it did not. And I went all the way up, and as I went to see the gentleman that was up there, all of a sudden I could hear him speaking French, and he did some English. And then I'm standing in front of him, and he says, Please, you have a great controversy in French. I've been waiting for five years for somebody to give it to me. And I, I have to tell you, finding our spirit prophecy in other languages are not that simple, even in other countries, as in, in Germany and different countries that they're not that easily accessible like we have here. And so the man just about, it's like he had gold in his hand. Well, what happens I didn't bother going past the dog? I'm not for getting bitten by a dog, let me tell you. But it took courage and asking God's power. So it just brought that to memory. Well, this morning, it's going to be a little different than it is on Mary Magdalene. It is one of my favorite stories. I can relate to them very much. My history is not Adventist and not Christian. And so you can also know, as I've spoken this week, if five boyfriends at one time, it's not a good idea. Not proud of it. But that's where my life was at one time. And one of those boyfriends was my husband. And he was a very patient man, let me tell you. Because we were all there and he knew it. And so God is very merciful. If he can be merc- you know, work with me, he can work with anybody. Because, um, yeah, it's just the way it is. What I want to share with you before I go into Mary Magdalene's story is hoping this will turn. Ah, that would help. I want you to really think about this quote. It's something the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night on. He says, please, you know what the scariest thing is? When he changes your talks. Not totally. Sometimes. And, uh, yeah, it can be a walk of faith, let me tell you. It says, take away suffering and need. And we should have no way of understanding the mercy and the love of God. Think about that. This is all in one quote. There's three of them here. No way of knowing the compassionate, sympathetic, heavenly father. Now think about that. It doesn't mean your motive is that, but it doesn't allow you to see or have a need. We're talking about a need, not a motive. Motive needs to be the love. By love is love awakened. But I'm talking about a need right now to realize and to get our attention wherever we are in our walk. Never does the gospel put on an aspect of greater loveliness than when it's brought to the most needy and destitute regions. Then it is that its light shines forth with the clearest radiance and the greatest power. Truth from the word of God enters the hovel of the peasant Rays from the sun of righteousness light up the rude cottage of the poor, bringing gladness to the sick and suffering. Angels of God are there, and the simple faith shown makes the crust of bread and the cup of water a banquet. But it's not just because they're poor. We can be extremely prideful when we're poor. Huge. Um, But often we find more need there. But we also have to see the need in it in whatever culture, whatever um, living conditions. The sin-pardoning Savior welcomes the poor and the ignorant and gives them to eat of the bread that comes down from heaven. It doesn't come from us. It comes from heaven. They drink of the water of life. Those who have been loathed and abandoned are through faith and pardon raised to the dignity of sons and daughters of God. What does it say? Raised to the dignity of the sons and daughters of God. They don't know it. But Christ died for every human being. Lifted above the world, they sit in heavenly places in Christ. They may have no earthly treasure, but they have found what? The pearl of great price. When you look in great controversy, not great, Christ object lesson, and it talks about the pearl of great price. After we read towards the end of the chapter, it says that Jesus saw us, us, human race, as the pearl of great price. Think about that. Do we have anything to offer? But he does see us as a pearl of great price. 
Now, this is hard, and many times when we share the love of God, we really don't understand and we don't appreciate as we should. And so often, we need to understand that, we, but we must have a knowledge of ourselves, a knowledge that will result in contrition before we can find pardon and peace. That happened with um, the Samaritan woman. It happened with Nicodemus. It happened with the nobleman. It happens with every human being. Before we really can appreciate Christ, we really need to see our need. And like the nobleman, he came to Jesus out of um, selfishness. And he was so afraid because he came with that selfishness that he would lose his son. And Christ worked with him to help him to see that he needed to be delivered from that selfishness. Now, this one's a hard one to take. The Pharisee felt no conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit could not work with him. Does that mean he didn't try to work with him? Absolutely. He works with everybody all the time as long as they're willing to listen. And even if we don't listen, we say, make me, make me willing to be made willing. I can't tell you how many times I pray that prayer. I'm not sure I would have, be where I am right now if I didn't do that. His soul, it says the Holy Spirit could not work with him. His soul was encased in a self-righteous armor, which the arrows of God, barbed and true aimed by angels' hands, fail to penetrate. Can we be that hard-hearted? Are we Pharisees? Could we? It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. He came to heal the what? Brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Luke 4.18 but they that are whole need not a physician. Luke 5.31. If we think we're whole and we're okay and we've done enough canvassing, enough this or enough that, I've done it. I've been in that situation. But I find that the Lord always keeps humbling me to a situation so that I look up again. Instead of looking this way, we're looking at that way. I need to be humbled. Ellen White actually asked herself to end up sick <clears throat> often when she was to be humbled because it allows you to stay still and you can't do all the things you want to do. And it really makes you concentrate on what's happening and really taking time for the Lord. Ministry, um, health ministry, or any of these kind of ministries are very difficult for us to be intemperate. It really is. It's huge. Been there, done it. And if you get to the point where your spiritual walk is affected, okay, you do have to work hard, though. No question about it. But if your spiritual walk is affected and you're not following what God asks you to do and you skip here and there and you're all over the place, what's happening? Your mind's not going to be as clear and you're not going to be honoring Christ. And those temptations, those darts that come at us are going to affect us. We must know our real condition. And guess who does that to us? Christ does that to us. He does. Or we shall not feel our need of Christ's help. We must understand our danger or we shall not flee to the refuge. We must feel the pain of our wounds or we should not desire healing. The Lord says, because thou sayest, I am what? Rich and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. I mean, that's a bad description, but God, but Christ gives us an answer to that problem. But do we recognize we're poor, blind, naked, miserable, wretched? Do we? Do I? And then, of course, we've read, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and the shape of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. The gold tried in the fire is the faith that works by love. Only this can bring us into harmony with God and bring us to righteousness, which is the white raiment. And clarity of eyes, discernment, to understand Whose character are we following? And this is a hard one. 
We may be active, we may do much work, but without love, agape love, not human love. We mix the two up, and we think we're doing, and then sometimes we are. Such love is dealt in the heart of Christ. So the love that we have to see, as we've been talking about the cross all week, <clears throat> we need to recognize that selfless love, and he can pour that in our hearts. But it's really hard on the pride to say, you know, I'm not quite what I think I am. I really have a problem. And then it says, and that was in Christ Object Lessons, uh, such love is dwelt in the heart of Christ. We can never be numbered with the family of heaven. Did you hear that? We have to have his love. I don't care how you look at it. We need his love. It's not happening any other way. That's the only way through, and it's because of Christ. And then it says, no man can of himself understand his errors. The heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. The lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. In one way only can a true knowledge of self be obtained, and that's through Christ. I remember when I did shows, and I was so excited doing all these shows on 3 Band years ago. And I was really walking all I knew, honestly, and the best that I knew. But it was maybe a couple years later, the Lord says, you know, you are not so surrendered as you think you were. You were really selfish. And I'm going, ah. Oh. Did God bless? Did he bring good out of it? He did. We had tremendous blessing. But we don't see our own heart. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, what? God wants to keep revealing to us. And it says, we must behold Christ. It doesn't come by doing. It comes by beholding. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own what? Weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. That's hard to take. We shall see ourselves lost and, and hopeless. The problem is that many times we get in that discouraging hopeless and stay there and cherish that. When God says, no, don't stay there. Look to Christ. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in the garments of self-righteousness like every other sinner. What sinner? Every other sinner. We're all alike. We shall see that if we are ever saved, it will not be through our what? Goodness, but through God's infinite grace. I am so thankful for infinite grace. It doesn't stop. And here's the prayer of the publican. We watched a short video of this, and it says, The prayer of the publican, this comes from Christ Object Lessons 159. The prayer of the publican was heard because it, by the way, there are two sets of people at the end of the time, Pharisees and publicans, it says. Two groups of people. Now, we know there's 144,000. Don't get me wrong. But there are two kinds of people. One would be like the Pharisee, and one would be like the publican. But I put the publican up here because I think you're pretty sure about the Pharisee was heard because it showed dependence reaching forth to lay hold upon omnipotence. Self to the publican appeared nothing but shame. Thus it must be seen by all who seek God, by faith, faith that renounces all self-trust. Now a lot of times we say selflessness, and that's true, but this is a saying self-trust into your own wisdom, into your ideas how to evangelize, your ideas to minister, your ideas of how to take care of people, whatever it is, we have a self-trust. And the more education you have, I have to tell you with my husband, he has many degrees, how much he's got to unlearn is incredible experience. Absolutely incredible. I have nothing, I mean, I have not had the experience he's had and the success he's had. And I'm telling you, I have come to appreciate a little bit more what he's going through. I'll tell you, there's a time I did not. But now when I see him and the things he has to go through, it's just incredible. Because he has to unlearn. Just like Moses had to unlearn, 
Remember? Moses went out in the wilderness, and he had to unlearn those. I'm not saying throw everything away. I'm not saying that. But it needs to be from God and in his mindset. Thus it must be seen. Wait. Self to the publican appeared nothing but shame. Thus it must be seen by all who seek God by faith. Oh, I said this. Self-trust. The needy supplicant, supplant, supplant is to lay hold upon what? There's the secret. Is the infinite power, the grace. But if you don't know what happened at the cross, the reason I spent so much time on the cross this week, a lot of people will say, oh, I already know that. Can you share something else with me? Share with me the doctrine. Share with me the commandments. I said, yes, I can share Christ in those. But if we don't see the cross, what are we beholding? And there is where selfishness and unselfish met, mercy and justice met. And so we want to tend to, and then when it says the Lord in his great mercy, not just a little, sent a most precious message to lift Christ up. It wasn't to hit people over the head. It was to put Christ back in. And that's my burden. Whether it's a health message or whatever I'm doing, is to put Christ back in it. Because that's the only thing that's going to give you power. No outward observances can take the place of simple faith an entire renunciation of self, but no man can empty himself of self. Did you know that? I can't empty myself of self either, and we tend to think we can do that. And it says, we can only consent for Christ to accomplish the work. Then the language of the soul will be, Lord, take my heart, for I cannot give it. It is thy property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. Save me in spite of myself, my weak, what? Every time I see myself as an unchristlike self, there's hope for me. I don't care whether it's about whatever. There's a thousand things that can happen to you in a very short period of time, it seems. Mold me. Do you let him do that? It's painful sometimes. And you know, I've been walking with quite a few people recently in a very bad circumstances. And they hold on to it. But when they let go, wow, what a change in their life and the way they look at things, everything. Holding on is bondage. It's heaviness. It's huge. Mold me, fashion me, raise me into a pure, holy atmosphere. Where what? The rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. What is it saying now? I really want you to think about it because we miss this all the time. I have for years. I wish I understood it a long time ago. My life would have been a lot easier in the sense of being with uh, more of a blessing. Let's put it that way. But it says, save me in spite of myself, my weak, unchristlike self. Mold me, fashion me. Why? So the rich current of thy love can flow through my soul. And, and every time you come up to speak, you think coming up to speak is a piece of cake? <laughs> this morning's one was quite a challenge for me. This morning when I was over at the church. And I'm being honest with you. I had about five things that had to get put into the situation. And I was praying since last night because I didn't know what God wanted. I knew what he wanted here, but I didn't know what he wanted over there. I have lots of stuff to tell. I want, but it better not be me. And like... And the Lord blessed. But I'm telling you, I, I'm like, Lord, I'm saying, Lord, I can't do this. I'm not able to do this. This is too hard. I'm telling you my real experience because some people think, oh, it's just natural. One day, Mary, um, Jennifer, I don't know where she went, but anyway, she one time saw me and she goes, you know, you're not as confident as I thought. You were really worried, concerned. I was. But I step forward and I say, Lord, make me willing to be made willing. I don't care if you've been talking for 25 years. It doesn't matter. What matters is what he wants. It is not, and this is an important one, it is not only at the beginning of the Christian life that this renunciation of self is to be made. At every advanced step heavenward it is to be renewed. All our good works are dependent on a power, what? Outside of 
ourselves. Therefore, there needs to be a continual reaching out of the heart after God, a continual earnest, heartbreaking confession of sin and humbling of the soul before him. Only by constant renunciation of self and dependence on Christ can we walk safely. Do you know that this walk, a lot of people will say, okay, well, I need to get all straightened out before I can do this or before I get married. Now, it's a good idea to be wise before you get married or courtship. There are principles that guard us. I'll tell you, it's a really good idea because I was not married under that. But later, we redid it because we wanted it with Christ. But again, this is going to happen to you see Jesus face to face or you go to sleep. So it's not just a one-shot deal. It's going to be a constant renunciation of ourselves. Because only when we're like that will we depend on Christ. Otherwise, we won't look at Christ, right? We will end up depending on ourselves somewhere, and we want to honor him. Now, here's a lesson for us all, and I was doing this this morning. You know the ten lepers, right? But I did not realize something about this story that's new. These lepers were so corrupted by disease that they had been restricted from society lest they should contaminate others. So can you imagine having leprosy, being put somewhere that you can't associate with others? I can relate to it a little bit when I was chemically sensitive, but I wasn't having to be shunned, but I had to stay outside for a while, quite a while. Their limits had been prescribed by the authorities. This is a lot worse and a lot painful, a lot more worse. And Jesus comes within their sight, and in their great suffering, they cry unto him who alone has power to relieve them. And Jesus bids them show themselves to the priests. They have faith to start on their way, believing in the power of Christ to heal them. And they do have belief that God can heal them, but not a deliverer of sin, not a deliverer of my heart and my selfishness. And as they go on their way, they realize that the horrible disease has left them, but only one has feelings of what? What? It's not knowledge. It's gratitude, realizing the forgiveness of Christ for you. And he had gratitude. Only one feels his deep indebtedness to Christ for this great work wrought for him. This one returns praising God. And the other nine went where? They were healed, but they kept going. But they never had a deliverance from the heart. But this man did. And in the greatest humiliation, he falls at the feet of Christ, acknowledging with thankfulness the work wrought for him. And this man was a stranger, not a Jew. What were the other nine? Jews. Jews. I was surprised by that. So the Gentiles are much more open than the Jews? Are the people from outside more open than we are? Could that be possible? But it's still his bride here. And this is his church. And I thought, okay. And many times we think we're okay. And I hate to think not sharing that to you. Now, Mary Magdalene had an uncle. Who was his uncle? You know who was her uncle, I should say. Who was her uncle? Simon. Uncle Simon. And in Desire of Ages, it says, Simon had led her into sin, the woman he now despised. So can you imagine? Here's a family member. So we could possibly have incest issues going on here. And how many devils was in her? Seven devils were in her. And Jesus didn't just go to her all at one time with all seven. It was one by one. I would imagine just thinking that that seventh one or that last one that came out probably had to do with Uncle Simon. The hatred that has to be in her, I can see it a little bit myself. The hate just takes you over. It consumes you because someone has inflicted something upon you, and it is terrible. But Mary Magdalene gives us hope. Because here was a woman that was freed from this selfishness. 
seven devils? Is that what you said? Seven devils? That's a lot, don't you think? A lot of times, even if we saw somebody with one devil, we're going the other way, other direction. But seven? And each time, he took time for her. And I've had to learn that lesson as far as working with people. Sometimes we think they're too far gone. Not a good idea. That's not Christ. Now, here's Mary Magdalene. And she's been delivered. What kind of joy would be in her life? And by the way, what would bring that joy in her life? Would she have seen the love and compassion and mercy from Jesus delivering her and praying with her each time? And so you can see that there's a heart appreciation going on. Did the disciples appreciate the Savior? Mm -mm, not at all. Now, I have to tell you something. If she's willing to give all to him, I'll tell you what. If I was in the situation of Mary Magdalene, would I crash Uncle Simon's party? Would you? Are you kidding? I would be in another country before I would come in face to face with something like that. But did she care? She didn't care at all. And not only that, she took everything she had that she was able to do in that spike nart, that ointment. And not only did she, she didn't even bring a towel. She didn't even wait to do a towel. She didn't do it just perfectly. How many people come up and they'll say, oh, you need to do it this way and that way and these and that and get your eggs all in the right order. It's nice to do a good job. Don't get me wrong. But God's looking for heart first. And Mary Magdalene was all heart. In fact, she was afraid. And it says in one of the quotes, it says that she didn't even want to be noticed. But, of course, the ointment spread her deed because the smell of the spikenard. And she put it, it just smelled up the whole area. And so what was Judas's and, and, and Judas, of course, was already um, attacking that situation, you know, and starting to whisper. And what did the disciples do? They decided to go along with it. Disciples were carried away with Judas. And then Judas said, well, look, what waste is there in this? What a waste to put all this money in it. And Judas said, well, if you had given it to me, I would have used it. And it says that even if he had that money, he would have put it in his own pocket. And you need to read the story again. Just because you read the story when you were young or read it again, you need to read it again and again and again. Um, there's always more for us to understand. But think about it. Here she's going into a crashing a party. That Uncle Simon's there, which is the last thing. But the joy and the deliverance that she feels is huge. You can't even put words on it. I can only relate to it. But the disciples, they've been walking with him for quite a while. And what happens? And it says here, I, I took a devotional my husband took one day. Christ delighted in the earnest desire of Mary to do the will of her Lord. He accepted the wealth of pure affection which his disciples did not, would not understand. Did you hear that? The desire that Mary had to do this service for her Lord was of more value to Christ than all the precious ointment in the world because it expressed, what do you think it expressed? That same word, appreciation of the world's redeemer. It was the love of Christ that constrained her. Where do you find that in the Bible? The love of Christ constrains us. Where is it in the Bible? Where is it? 2 Corinthians 5, 14, and 15. It's the love of Christ that constrains us. The matchless excellence of the character of Christ filled her soul. Wow. That is so cool. But she was afraid to be noticed. She wasn't going in the ministry and saying, you know what I'm doing? I'm getting all the money I have to buy this spike nard so I can put this over Jesus. And normally it's only a few drops that are put on. She poured the whole thing. And then she used her hair to clean his feet and wept. 
if I could go through this without crying. <laughs> the appreciation is incredible, incredible. And remember, it says this is to be shared with wherever the gospel is being preached. And there's a quote, till the end of time. Hmm, that might mean that the experience of Mary Magdalene is an experience that the 144,000 will have? Is that so? Hmm, interesting thought. The ointment was a symbol of the heart of the giver. It was the outward demonstration of a love fed by heavenly streams until it overflowed. Now, I had a situation happen to me that I, I can really relate. You know, we have, my husband is a banker. He's always going to be a banker. But God has really worked on him. And um, I put some money aside sometimes for something that God wants for. It's not quite the same now. Now it's different. It's quite different. But at that time, I had to kind of get some money and then use it when God allowed me to use it for some special that the Lord would impress me on. So I had this money. I don't know how much it was. I don't even remember that. And I held on to it, and it was about a year. And as I was doing that, I said, oh, Lord, I'm not hearing you. Because I know you don't want me to collect all this money. And I think it was up to about 1000 I don't know what it was. I don't remember what it was. And it was quite a bit. And I said, Lord, I'm getting greedy. I'm getting selfish. I, I, you know, I need to use this money. Nothing happens. And nothing happens. And nothing happens. And weeks go by. And then we were doing some, you know, I don't know. We were doing a Christmas program. We do believe that when Christmas comes, that Christ is the center of it. And I do whatever I can to bring Christ to the center of their experience. And so we invite a lot of people to a special program to share Christ with them and celebrate with them. And I woke up that morning, and the Lord says, I want you to get gift cards. And I did. I must have got, that must have been more than that kind of money. See, I'm not a numbers person. My husband is, so he makes up for me. But I, I think I got about, I think this first one we had, it was like 75 people we had come. And I bought gift certificates of $25 for, or $10 maybe. I don't know what it was, but for 75 people. When my husband heard about it, he goes, what are you doing? And I'm going, what do you mean, what am I doing? He says, you can't do that. I'm going, yes, I can. Because <laughs> the money is here, and it has nothing to do with him or anybody else, I can put it where God wants it. He really had a problem. This is quite a few, well, years ago. And he goes, well, okay. And I says, all right. Now, we had a big community services, and we had a lot of people going there, and what was happening at community services, which I had a problem with personally, but I wasn't saying anything to anybody, they were all lining up to get their food and get this and this, but they had conditions put on them tremendous conditions. You know, they couldn't do this, and they couldn't do that, and I'm not getting specific because it gives you ideas, and I don't want that. And I saw the things that were happening, and I said, Lord, have mercy on us. And so the idea was that if I did this big Christmas dinner thing and celebrate with them, there were people that came to the dinner that came around the corner, and they saw the beautiful setup. I like beautiful setups. We did it in our restaurant. It's a little extravagant, I think. I've come to learn, but that's where it was. But we had it set up and everything, and the people came around the corner, and they looked. And some of these are very poor people. And they looked at it, and they go to me, that's not for me. That can't be for me. And they walked the other way. I went running after them. I says, I put this together for you. You come here. I want you to sit down. And they go, really? And then what happens is we did the dinner and everything, and we share, you know, because I like to do that with them. And we had about 75, I think, that first time around. And the other Adventists that wanted to help us, and I'm not trying to be critical of Adventists, but they really didn't understand giving. Giving is getting something back. There is no giving back. Giving is giving, not receiving back. You, I'll tell you what, it does come back, but you're not looking for that to come back. It overflows and overflows. And the people at the end were given a gift certificate, and we gave them a bag of stuff too, okay? And the animal just goes, they don't appreciate it. They won't really like it. What are you doing? And each time I got to give it to them. And they go, ma'am, is there any, um, what do you call it, attachments or conditions that are on this? And I go, ma'am, no. I just pray I'll see you in heaven. 
So I'm looking forward to seeing you. And they have this big smile, and they walk away. And some of the Adventists are standing over there, and they go, what is she doing? And I was trying to explain to them, we don't give to receive or do anything. Giving is giving, totally giving. You can't outgive God. I'm telling you personally, you cannot outgive God. And the first year we had 75, next year we had 150, the year after that we had 300 people. And people coming to the church and joining the church. And they didn't come in because they got coerced into it. They saw that they were being loved and they could use the money however they wanted to. It was a gift. Christ gave us a gift. And Mary Magdalene saw the gift. The gift of being healed because we have this equipment that's just not going to make it and I do a really messy job with mine and you know my husband eventually gave some money in with it and now he doesn't see it quite that way he's much more giving of things tremendously but can you imagine a banker I'm telling you he spent how many years I don't know how old he is anyways many many years doing it and you know he's been conditioned and so God's going to work with them, just like he works with me. And it says, The work of Mary was just the lesson the disciples needed to show them that the expression of their love for him would be pleasing to Christ. He had been everything to them, and they did not realize that soon they would be deprived of his presence, that soon they could offer him no token of their gratitude for his great love. The loneliness of Christ separated from the heavenly courts Living the life of humanity was never understood or, here's that word again, appreciated by the disciples as it should have been. Their knowledge gave them a true sense of the many things they might have done for Jesus, expressive of the love and gratitude of their hearts. When Jesus was no longer with them, they began to see how they might have shown him attentions that would have brought gladness to his heart. You know, it's me. I wish I had time ago given that appreciation you guys are young i'm getting old i wish i had understood a long time ago they no longer cast blame upon mary but upon themselves we're our worst enemy we're our worst problem and whatever he's allowed in your life he's put there because if you didn't go through it you may not have a need for jesus right now the problem is you don't look up and you don't try to understand what's going on. And we're more concerned about what so-and-so thinks about us. That, do we not? And so they no longer cast blame. Oh, if they could have taken back their censuring, their presenting the poor as more worthy of the gift than was Christ. Because that's what they're doing. They were making that more important than Jesus. They felt the reproof keenly as they took from the cross the bruised body of the Lord. Can you imagine being the one that takes the bruised body out? The same want is evident in our world today, but few appreciate all that Christ is to them. If they did, the great love of Mary would be expressed. The anointing would be freely bestowed. The expensive ointment would not be called a waste. Nothing would be thought too costly to give for Christ. No self-denial or self-sacrifice too great to be endured for his sake. How many of you want more of Christ, want to understand, truly, just the way you are. You can't change yourself. How many of you really would like Christ to put healing in your life, to show you more about him, and to be able to honor? May we stand. Father in heaven, I thank you Thank you. Thank you. Amen.
like to open our hymnals to number 520, He Hideth My Soul. Number 520. And let's stand as we sing the closing song. in heaven. We thank you that we can always come to you knowing 
that you know what's best for us. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless us. Long-suffering and patient God. In your name, amen. amen. amen.